I believe because of the screen. Eh? Um, a very good morning. It has been a wonderful month of May and we have had many special Sundays. I must say and I must remind you every Sunday is very special. Yeah, regardless of the occasion, it's the Lord's Day and how you and I have made effort to prepare to come, uh, not by chance, by the divine grace of God to bring us all of us here safely. Yeah, so uh, look into somebody's eyes and say, you know, thank you for being here this morning. It's not by chance. Yeah, look, look, at least look, I know, say hi, and if you're not done so, please. This Sunday is also special. We have had a few important um, services, starting of which on the first Sunday we had a Thanksgiving service to recognize God's faithfulness. Then on the second Sunday we had um, Mother's Day, yeah, which is so significant. And on last week we had a pastoral installation. This Sunday I also like to deviate from Ephesians, the study of Ephesians for a short week again, for a short while. Because today is otherwise known as the Pentecost Sunday. It's significant to our Christian faith because it has been about 50 days and Christians around the world will celebrate this day as the 50th day uh, since our Lord has died and resurrected. So they call it Pentecost 50th day. Uh, most will remember the Pentecost Sunday as the day, you know that, as we have led and we have looked, read earlier on, God poured out His Holy Spirit on His church and on his people, enabling his disciples to perform miracles, and empowering his disciples to profess their faith, and they have done so in speaking more form in various forms, such as speaking in tongues, in prophesying, and even inspired teaching, which again resulted in about 3,000 being added to that number that day. So it's significant. Now, our conviction is that People, from time to time, God will and God has continued to pour His Spirit upon His church, upon every one of us, so that we are emboldened, we are empowered to do His will. God has historically and continues to do so in extraordinary ways to empower you and I to bring forth salvation. He pours His Spirit in fresh, in unexpected, and even unprecedented ways onto us. And therefore, I believe that until the task of sharing the gospel, bringing the gospel to the ends of the world is completed, you and I have a very high calling, a high privilege, and a responsibility to pray. To ask the Lord, as we have sung earlier on in, in, in worship, to pray in our hearts, God, would you pour out your Spirit upon us that we may be courageous in witnessing and in, 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 in evangelizing. You must understand that the pouring of the Holy Spirit is not for a good few, but is for the work of the kingdom to be accomplished. This is so much in line with where we have been on our journey as a church. And I believe this, some, this is something that must continue to capture us, our attention, being our vision. Something that we will grab with, grapple with, work on in the rest of our days and our life. Followers of Jesus, fishers of men. And so in the planning, and these are just planning, we need to pray. In the planning leading up to our church retreat, you know that the emphasis on our upcoming church retreat in June will be on the topic of evangelism. It is our desire that we can all learn, share our struggles, be equipped to be able to share the gospel um, and to be a friend to somebody else. So this morning, my prayer has been, don't come with that, you know, academic hat uh, and say, I want to learn something. I pray that at the end of today's time together, there may be a persuasion within us that we will want to pray, us at least, Pray, pray unceasingly for this fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we may be courageous to evangelize. Would you do that? Let's pray together again. Father Lord, this is your word and I know that your word is life. And therefore, Lord, speak to us because apart from your word and apart from Christ, God, we can be very dead in our spiritual interests. 
So humbly I ask God that you answer this prayer of ours, that would you fill us with your spirit. Fill us, O oh God. For those who feel dry, refresh them, O oh God. For those who are fervent, overflow, fill us in an overflow, so that, Lord, we may be courageous, like in the days of Acts, to be an evangelist, to be a prophet, to be a teacher, and all in all, to proclaim the wonders and the glory of God to people around us in a time like this. We give thanks and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a scripture that we are reading on. Do have your um, uh, handphone on, or at least have a text down there. I'm going to invite Abel to lead us in that scripture reading, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Thank you so much, Abel. If it helps you, there are three key observations that I want to share from this text and draw two key principles this morning. So three very key observations. Let's dive in. In verse 1, the disciples, you would have read in verse 1, the disciples were devoted to coming together. When the day of Pente uh, Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. The context is very simple. After Jesus has ascended, uh, resurrected, he came back, he appeared to his disciples for a period of about 40 days, and in that 40 days, he began to, spoke, to speak about the kingdom of God. He began to instruct the disciples and says, wait for the Holy Spirit, because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there comes a power within you to go and witness, to be God's witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, if you will immerse yourself with me, like the disciples then, then and then, that Jesus was our hope. Jesus died. Seems like a death of a vision. But when Jesus resurrected and appeared again, there was a glimpse, or rather a great return of that hope. It was an assurance that Jesus is God. And so the disciples abandoned almost everything else, their despair and all discouragement, they were devoted to coming together. They were earnestly waiting for the promise of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They constantly gathered as a church together. On this occasion, we have read in verse 1, these followers of Jesus, not just the disciples, by the way, Mary, and some of the other ladies, they were all gathered in the upper room. They were all together in one place. They were devoted to coming together. I need you to capture that because I've stressed the importance of every one of us to be committed and to be devoted to coming together in the recent months. The Lord commands us to, in, verse, in Hebrews chapter 10, 
and I've been just reading through Exodus, God says, observe your Sabbath. This morning when I was just spending time in the scripture, Exodus 31, scripture says that observe the Sabbath because this is going to be a sign for you and for the generations to come that you are set apart, you are sanctified to the Lord. I mean, we know that on many occasions, what stands out is the way that we prioritize what is important in our life. And the devotion of coming together, not just on a Sunday. In fact, what are the things that are important to you? Your men's ministry, ladies' ministry, if it's important and you know that that is where God has placed you at to minister, to be involved in, put it as the highest priority. And we have seen that in our BSS study before. Leaders just telling the, 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 uh, the employer and says, I need that time away so that I can be involved in something that's important to me. So the people then were devoted. And I commend all of you because I don't shoot any one of us down. I think the people, the fact that you are gathered here, you have sacrificed and you have given a devotion to this family and a gathering of people here to worship God. And I know beyond that worship, you are here to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. That's what Hebrew says. Spur one another on as we see the day approaching. Let's affirm one another. Let's not take one another's commitment and devotion for granted. At the same time, we need to make every effort. Can I encourage all of us, all of us to encourage those who are struggling in this commitment? Because there will be. The Bible says so. When people are not here on that Sunday, which is significant, drop them a text. Drop a message to them. Drop a call to them whenever they're not around not just because of the attendance, but to catch up and to see how they are doing. Meet up with them to see how they are doing. So be devoted to coming together. The other evident thing that they were doing, besides the coming together to worship and for mutual encouragement, one other very important thing is they gathered to pray. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they all gathered together constantly in prayer along with the women and the Ma Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. These followers of Jesus were gathered, in other words, they were joined together constantly, regularly to pray. Prayer is the key, the vitality, the life of a church. Beyond the worship, beyond the mutual encouragement, Prayer is the key to our life together. I wouldn't go through, but you have read through the book of Acts. Prayer was like a DNA of the church then. It was the characteristic. On so many occasions, you read, I've listed down there a bit small. They gathered to pray when Peter and John were released and they were asking and the place shook and began to feel the Holy Spirit. They prayed and they fasted as they were thinking about who to send forth. They prayed and they fasted when there was an issue and a situation and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. The early church prayed, God moved and God worked on their behalf. That is that power of prayer and that was the DNA of that prayer, of that church. I want to leave the first principle to you. Prayer precedes the infilling and the move of God's Holy Spirit. If there's one thing that is key, maybe a condition that is a norm for all of us is that prayer will precede the infilling and the move of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to ask all of you, let us all pray. If we have been praying regularly, continue to do so. Well done. If we have not been, let us pray. Let prayer be a DNA of X Baptist Church. May prayer be that fundamental, distinctive characteristic of every one of us who would call ourselves a member of X Baptist Church. I think that's powerful. Not just for a name and a character itself, but that's what the early, early church is. And that's what the early founders of Ex Baptist Church believed in. 
uh, you may have heard it, I shall put it across that the name Acts was proposed and adopted because of the importance of prayer to the early founders of Acts Baptist Church. And in case you didn't know it, then ACTS stands for the acronym Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. So the early church, the early founders believe in it, and therefore they name Ex Baptist Church as Ex Baptist Church. In the early book of Acts, they believe in prayer, and therefore they pray. If you are a member of Ex Baptist Church, pray. Pray on all occasions. Pray in every situation. Are we praying regularly, fervently? Would you please be a bit more intentional to set aside time to pray? I want to request in all our ministry meetings and church meetings, I think it's appropriate for us to always perhaps set 10 minutes aside, either at the start or the end of the meeting to pray so that the Spirit leads us in all our gatherings. So I appeal to ministry heads, could you please facilitate and lead us in this? Just 10 minutes to pray. Either at the start or at the end. Not as a pattern but more so as a dependence because prayer precedes the move and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let us be devoted to come together to worship God. Let us be devoted to come to encourage one another. Let us be devoted to come to pray. The second observation is taken from verse 2 to verse 11. That's a huge chunk. But we can begin to see as the Spirit fills the disciples, then the disciples were declaring the wonders of God. Disciples were devoted to coming together to pray. The second observation, the disciples were declaring the wonders of God. It is said that some has focused on these verses and used these verses to teach that speaking in tongues, which is of course what the text is all about, becomes the gift is it is the gift and the evidence of every believer's salvation. There is a teaching that goes on that says that if you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you must be able to speak in tongues or at least learn to pick up to speak in tongues. I humbly reject that teaching. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, Paul says, Now, all Christians will speak in tongues. He says, do all will speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The clear answer is no. Why do I want to bring that up? Because I feel that the focal point of this passage is not the tongues alone, which I will explain, but is that those who are filled with the Spirit, and you and I are filled with the Spirit, the evidence of that filling of that Holy Spirit is the disciples begin to declare the wonders of God. Otherwise, our salvation is, in sh is, is shaken. The focal point of this passage is beyond the speaking in tongues. But importantly, in verse 11, we hear them, those who were filled with the Spirit, they were declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. In other words, as I said, you and I who are filled with the Spirit or will be filled with the Spirit will declare the wonders of God. But the means to which the Holy Spirit works can differ and cannot be determined by us. The way and the means that the Holy Spirit works to reveal the wonders of God could be in many forms. One of which is a spirit-filled worship. I remember when I was unbelievable. I attended Pase Fuke Panjang. And then and then when I just immersed myself, regularly attended the youth worship. One of the things that tuned and turned my heart and God used that was the power of worship. When I observed Christians, brothers among me, sisters among me, declaring the wonders of God in worship, I knew deep in my heart there was something that was special. And then and then I began to tune my heart towards the spiritual thing. So don't undermine the power of God moving in and through your declaration on a Sunday worship. And we pray that. Spend 10 minutes before that and pray. Feel us, Lord, in our time of worship so that your power moves. 
Another form could be inspired preaching and teaching. I don't know whether you feel it. There are occasions that I know that when I talk, it just comes forth like a teacher. And uh, there are many other occasions, I just knew something that the Spirit was just deep within me. And I was saying things that was beyond my script, declaring the oneness of God. And that happens. When the Spirit comes upon you, the means is not determined by you, but you begin to profess and proclaim and declare the wonders of God beyond yourself. And it can come from really inspired teaching and also the gift of healing. So what I want to emphasize is this. Those who were filled with the Spirit were declaring the wonders of God. The means can differ. And on this occasion, the way that the Spirit chose to move was that disciples were declaring the wonders of God in other language, in their native language, as the Spirit enabled them so that those who gathered could understand the wonders of God. I think as simple as that. So to be filled with the Spirit, I need to explain, it is just that overwhelming encounter with the glorious greatness of God. And you begin to pour forth praise, either in worship, either in proclamation to somebody, and it spills over to become a very courageous witnessing. That is, to me, to be filled with the Spirit. The essence of being filled with the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, is this overwhelming experience of the greatness of God, resulting in a spilling over of courageous, passionate praise and worship. Pray that for yourself. Pray that for yourself. There was an occasion I was listening attentively to the scripture reading. I shared that before. Um, I'll share this to encourage, um, and it can happen to any one of us, and not as if that I could orchestrate that. Just that posture. Just deeply immersing in the scripture. Can't remember what text. But as the Spirit just began to convict me of the wonders, the greatness of God, my tears began to flow. And then and then I, I felt that here am I appreciating the greatness of God. Then beside me, my grandmother, who has not yet known Christ, is seated down there. The conviction of the Spirit came upon me so real. I just needed to speak in tongues, if you like it. I just witnessed to her speaking about the wonders, the salvation, the glorious truth about who God is in Cantonese. I can't, I don't know what I'm saying. But the Spirit is so overwhelming, you just needed to tell somebody about who Christ is. That is an example of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And I pray we can have regular experiences of that. The disciples were courageous in professing the wonders of God as the Spirit comes upon them. We see that subsequently in Acts because it to illustrate you again, even for Peter, you couldn't say that the only mean to, to be filled with the Spirit was the tongue because he stood up and he spoke courageously, declaring the wonders and the glorious thing about God. So the disciples in subsequently, the followers of Jesus, filled with the Spirit, they were professing, declaring the wonders of God. And we need to be followers of Jesus that are courageous in declaring the wonders of God. There lies the second principle. If, if prayer precedes the infilling and the move of the Holy Spirit, then I want to let you know, profession follows the infilling and the move of the Holy Spirit. Prayer precedes the infilling. Profession follows the infilling and the move for the Holy Spirit. As you meditate, you think through, you have to answer this question together with me. Am I declaring the wonders of God to others? Why and why not? Is it because we are not yielded to the Spirit? I like the word Yong Chen used. Are we sensitive to the Spirit. And this sensitivity can either grow or die off, especially when there are sins and there are pride in our lives. This sin and pride in our life can quench the Holy Spirit, as the Scripture says. Or people, is it because 
we, you, and I have been preoccupied by the affairs of this world and are not sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit that lives in me. Or perhaps we have not been consistent and persevering in our prayer, even pressing in through fasting for a certain cause that you are longing for. Profession of the wonders of God follows the infilling and the move of God's Holy Spirit. I want to be with a church that prays. I want to be with a church that as the Spirit comes upon us and He will profess the wonders of God. I need to qualify. I must say again, it is the Lord's prerogative when and how He chooses to pour out His Spirit upon us. The suddenly in verse 2 informs us God pours out His Spirit in His own timing and in His own way. But I think there are certain basics, conditions, evidence in the Scripture, patterns, we would like to say it, that then and then the Spirit moves in and through us. This includes, as you have seen in the book of Acts, that earnest, desperate desire to seek the Lord. The condition of a heart that is yielded to the Lord rather than indulging in our flesh and our sinful flesh. It is that condition that we will set our mind, every one of us, on the things of God. Setting our hearts and our mind on the Word of God and the works of God revealed in the Scripture. That you and I are preoccupied with the godly things than with ourselves. And that is why I do not apologize as I challenge you and I lovingly will still challenge you to please continue to spend time to read a chapter of your Bible day by day. Unless you saturate yourself in the Scripture, something else will capture your heart and your mind. That is the only way out. And I hold no apologies if you are really exodus with me. It has been about the tabernacle and the faithful records of the details. Sometimes I just take a a step out and I appreciate the glorious intent of God that He is a detailed God and He wants to dwell among His people in His way. And there are more to learn from my Zodas and then now Leviticus. Please understand my heart, the intent of reading a chapter a day. It's not the end. I encourage you to do so. Saturate your mind on the scripture. We also have a God given responsibility to tell others. And I want to tell you, tell even Christians about the wonders of God. Unless we hear enough or we say enough, our hearts grow cold. And I can tell you, it's that responsibility to tell. Sometimes you think that, well, it's like in the days of X, large gathering of people. I tell you, they are, it's powerful, equally powerful when the Spirit comes upon you and just to witness to one individual. Let the Spirit fuse you that you may proclaim and declare the wonders of God. It is all about God working through you that results in one other, some others, coming to hear and to see the wonders and the glory of God. Would you do that? Whom are the individuals and people God has divinely placed before you that you may profess His wonders? Even as a church, I've asked that at the start of the year. I've not forgotten that. I want to encourage all of you, whenever God is at work in your life, be courageous to share how the wonders of God in your life to encourage the body of believers here. Because this is a safe space. Unless we practice that enough to talk and to profess the wonders of God here in a safe place among brothers and sisters, it is very difficult when you're out there alone. So do that. 
whenever the Lord has just moved in your life. Drop me a text in the week. Share some pointers about what you are sharing. We'll arrange for you in that following just for you to share. So the disciples were declaring the wonders of God. The disciples were devoted to coming together. Last observation, which is a sad one, I must say, the disciples, and I put inverted uh, comma, I'll let you know why. The disciples were divided when God worked wonders. You see that in, in the last verse from jo- uh, verse 12 to 13. They were amazed, they were perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? And verse 13 says, some, however, make fun of them and said they had too much wine. It's a sad one. Because as the Spirit moves, as I said, in unexpected and unprecedented ways, these disciples who were familiar with the Scripture, the Jews, and they were God's chosen people, they were divided in their response to the wonder of God that was happening. It was a miraculous work, but the disciples, the Jews, were divided. They were filled with amazement and perplexity, but that perplexity gave way to two very different responses, one of which a group says, seriously asked, what does this mean? They seek to understand the wonder of God that was happening. The other group, verse 13, mock and leap to a very natural explanation, maybe almost skeptical. These people must be filled with the wine. And you know, Peter explained later on, it's only nine in the morning. How can they be filled with the wine? Why do I want to illustrate this? And this is a caution to all of us. And I observe that happening in my own life at times. Whenever the Holy Spirit is poured out in an extraordinary power, a division can happen in a Christian community like that. Let me explain that. Whenever God moves, some can genuinely inquire, the scripture says, therefore, to test understand what is happening, seek to understand, hold fast to what is good. These are the people that God continues to nurture, teach and reveal more. On the other group, the outsider, the others, they stand outside, they start to mock and they write off the enthusiasm, the work, as merely human. They explain it off almost like in very natural things. I don't know. I wonder, somebody comes up here and share a testimony. What goes through your mind? Skeptical? Rational? Or are you seeking to understand how God is at work, resulting in praise and glory to God? And that is important. Are you generally a skeptic or a seeker at the works and the wonders of God. When the testimony is shared, the testimony of God's wonder is shared. When God has worked something already miraculously in your life, are we generally a skeptical, a skeptic? Or are you seeking? Are you using your logic to explain and rationalize the work of God? Or do we seek to understand and appreciate the greatness of God? giving praise to God. What we need is, a ver- is, is very much a discerning, an expectant, and an open heart that say, what indeed is this God you are doing? And then listen for a biblical answer. Let me stress that. When God works wonders in your life, in the life of Ex Baptist Church, the posture that we must continue to take on is one to discern, to have an expectant, to have an open heart, to ask, what indeed is this? And then listen to a biblical answer. I want to use this wonderful news. It's a real news. It's, not, it's the testimony. It's the declaration of the wonders of God to encourage all of you the move of the Lord among us as we pray. 
And I do that so that I could call all of us again to be devoted to praying, to seeking the Lord's will in all this, rather than to be skeptical and logical when God is already at work. You remember at AGM, there was, of course, a valid uh, concern, I'll put it, over the budget, more so over the the projected expenses over our year-on-year collection of tithes and offerings. I think some of us could recall that. So that was a valid, and I put it as a valid, a very valid concern. The projected deficit due to the increases of expenses, uh, more so as a family here because of the staff coming on, on board myself, and also with Pastor Joshua, and also uh, with the rental of this place. You see, I shouldn't go that first. Now, then the good news, okay, God has provided. I remember one member stood up and says, trust God, God will provide. Behold, even before the end of the year, just this week, I shall not mention the name and the details, please. Just this week, we received a letter from our finance institution. The miraculous wonder of God happened. They offered an interest rate that tripled what they offered previously in our last term. I won't even mention the numbers. But help you to understand what that simply means is that they projected interest because of our fixed deed with this institution has also tripled. And that tripling sum is enough to cover whatever deficit that we're talking about, including continuing to give to our mission. When I received the letter that offer, again, uh, practice of the scripture, am I skeptical and logical and says, look, the, all the financial institutions are increasing their interest rate, of course I should get one. But I'm inquiring with you. I want you to inquire with me that the wonder of God has happened. What is our response? One of the things I'm very clear, as you and I are faithful to do what God tells us either through the scripture or the Holy Spirit, God will always provide a way out and God reveals himself that we may declare the wonders of God. I'm convinced in the Bible, God has called a collective team of leaders and I want to continue to expand the pastoral team, either in a full-time role or either as a lay leaders, so that there will be that collective wisdom that comes together in leading the church. I'm also convinced moving here is not by a, a human effort or logical things. It is a divine move of God. And I'm still inquiring with the Lord, uh, inquire with me, what does all these things mean, Lord? What does all these things mean? God has provided. What is our response and our reaction? One of logic, to explain, or do we seek to understand and appreciate the greatness of God, resulting in praise and glory to God? My heart is warm this week when I receive the letter. We must have that experience here. In conclusion, three key observations. Disciples were devoted to coming together. Disciples were declaring the wonders of God. And disciples were even divided at the wonders of God. Two key principles. Prayer presides the infilling and the move of the Holy Spirit. But profession follows the infilling and the move of the Holy Spirit. People of God, what would you do? after hearing a word like that. What is the thing that we must do? Pray. Something that God alone can move. And as I said at the start, when we pray, God moves. What is that greater thing to do? That is the bonus that comes forth because it is a battle that belongs to the Lord. The work of evangelism is a work that belongs to the Lord. Holy Spirit, fill us anew. Wherever that you are, I want to spend the next 20 minutes, if you please indulge with me. I want to spend the next 20 minutes getting us to pray, not just in response to today's word, but forming a culture, an increasing culture. We have been praying, but an increasing culture among ex Baptist Church to pray. So I want to use that as a guide, as a framework, we're going to spend just 20 minutes um, gathered into groups of four to six so that there is a people among you, 
uh, we are pre using the acronym ACTS, five minutes of adoration, compassion, thanksgiving, and supplication. I'm going to guide you so that you're not uh, alone in that prayer. Can, would you do that with me, please? Can, would you just gather into groups of four to six and you have been seated for a long while, stand and pray, la. Yo, so that your hand can move, your voice can be projected. So stand and pray, or you want to be seated, go ahead. Find four to six others. It won't take too long, I will be facilitated. Yes, come on. What greater thing shall we do at the end of a sermon like that but to pray? Okay, young people, you have your groups of six, four to six. Wonderful. And make this time a very meaningful time, just trusting the Lord. Okay, come with a persuasion as we pray God moves, as we pray God fills us. And I want to be amazed at the work of God and God in His prerogative work within us. In the first segment, in the first five minutes, I'd like you to adore God and simply every one of us um, just begin to recall and profess who God is, His names and His attributes. You don't need to elaborate. Just adore God. And I'm going to put up a list for you so that it can help you if you need to, the names of God. You just uh, begin to agree. So for the next five minutes, just begin to praise God. Thank you, God. You are Alpha and Omega. Go ahead now and pray. Wherever the name of God comes to you, just begin to say thank you. You are Alpha and Omega. Praise you, Lord. Mm, you are the great shepherd, God. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords, God. There is none like you. You are our deliverer. You are our be provider, God. You are a good shepherd. You lead us. You protect us. You provide for us. Lord. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. And you are full of grace, giving us everything we need.
in the next five minutes, would you go into this area of confession? Whether confessing, of, and that I mean confessing areas that we have come short of. It may not be you, maybe our observation about each other and the church and our commitments, and maybe our attitude, our posture towards coming church gathering. It could be in an area of a lack of prayer, that the fear and there's a fear of rejection and embarrassment of not profess for not professing the oneness of God. And sometimes we could be very skeptical and logical, even when God has worked wonders. So would you spend the next five minutes just confessing our weaknesses before God? Tell me now there are so many at times we don't just
having confessed, you know, God's works and God's promises are so precious. And so I'd like you to thank God for His words, His promises, and maybe His works. Be thankful for the Spirit that is in every one of us. Be thankful for your leaders and members just within your group there. Be thankful for the place that we have every Sunday to worship. Be thankful. So would you just spend the next five minutes just begin to give thanks if you just recollect who God is again and His provision and all. Just, I just begin to give thanks there. Thank you, God. Thank God for your provision again, God. in you.
in the last five minutes, I think there are requests in line with where we have heard about gathering and also pray for maybe our gatherings on Sundays and our ministry meetings. Strengthen, Lord, you know, ask the Lord to strengthen each of the time that we gather. Maybe for us in the commitment and devotion, the sacrifices that we need to make, that we may achieve the purposes of God as we gather on Sundays. Yeah? Um, I want to pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit upon all, maybe the lost, the struggling, you know, the nominal, the young, the old, the mature. So pray for that bonus. So as the Lord leads you, just begin to commit our petition, our request to the Lord. Then I'll close all of us with a word.
as you continue in your supplication, and there's an encouragement from the scriptures, Matthew 6. And the teaching is not that you should not pray, but I want you to be encouraged because the scripture says the Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. And so, Lord, we thank You. You are our Father in heaven. Hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, we pray, only today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This we all pray together. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for participating, joining our hearts together to pray.